Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another lunchtime seminar organized jointly by the IUA and the AAA. It is again a hybrid seminar, and I especially welcome all those dialing in from the UK and abroad. Our topic today is Ballas General Average with the subtitle, No Cargo, No Problem. I can remember a few cases, a few ballast ship uh, GA cases that were in fact a bit uh, problematic, but uh, let's see what we learn today. Our presenter is Nanami Hara. Uh, Nanami is a senior hull adjuster with Rela here in London. She grew up with a master mariner father and has uh, memories of visiting large ships, even as a child. She studied at uh, Waseda University in Tokyo, where she was introduced to maritime law and marine insurance. Uh, she initially joined RHL in Tokyo, was also on secondment in uh, Liverpool and London, before moving permanently to the UK in 2015, first to Swansea, where she uh, did her LLM, and then she joined uh, RHL in London before switching to RELA last year. Nanami, thank you very much for being the presenter today. I wish you good luck thank and you. the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this introduction and thank you to the AAA and IUA for giving me this opportunity for, uh, to present at the seminar. And thank you everyone for attending today, just uh, in person and online. My presentation today is about gen uh, ballast general average. As an average adjuster, when I receive a notification of an active casualty, one of the first questions I ask is whether there is a cargo on board. This is of course to know whether there is a general average if the answer is no, there usually is a slight relief amongst everyone involved in a casualty. However, regardless of the, uh, our relief, the owners still need to get the vessel into a safe place and effect repairs so that the vessel can carry on. Without the cargo on board, can the owner recover what would have been general average expenses? Uh, in this kind of case, a ballast GA may come in handy. Uh, here are the points I will cover today. Uh, to begin, my presentation is based on English law and practice mostly, uh, except the last section where I touch on the cover provided under different policies. And hopefully by the time that I reach a conclusion, everyone can say, no cargo, no problem. Uh, now, firstly, let's recap on the general average very quickly. The definition of GA Act is provided in the York Counter Bureau, Rule 8. I quoted in the presentation the 94 version of Rule A, but it hasn't been changed since the Rule A was introduced in 1924. So this is a pretty solid definition of the GA Act. Uh, there are several key criteria for there to be uh, to be a general average, there has to be sacrifice or expenditure, and they have to be intentionally uh, reasonably incurred. It has to be for common safety, and there has to be a real peril. And most importantly, for today's presentation anyway, there has to be a common maritime adventure. Uh, there's no doubt a common maritime adventure exists if there is a cargo on board being carried from a place A to, one, uh, a to B. When there is a GA situation in accordance with the rule A, the owner will be able to make a general average claim according to the rest of your contract rule. These are some, po some proportions are claimable from the cargo interest or time charters and owner's insurance such as Machinery and PNI uh, comes to cover uh, 
certain, uh, certain uh, proportion. Effectively, in principle, the owners can recover the GA disbursement in full, except any deductibles or under insurance under the policy. Now, ballast GA is a term for general average while the vessel is in ballast. So it is what it says on the tin. The key factor here is there's no cargo on board. For example, the vessel machinery failed on the way to the loading port or fire on the way to an annual dry docking, perhaps. However, in this situation, there's a big question if you look into a potential general average claim. What is the common maritime adventure? Defining common maritime adventure is important in a few ways when we consider barras general average. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the criteria for GA Act. So if there's no common maritime adventure, there's no GA. The English law also says that there must be more than one interest involved in the judgment of Kemp and Halliday in 1866. The judge stated that it is essential that there should be a voluntary sacrifice to preserve more subjects than one. This is reflected in uh, section 66 of the Marine Insurance Act, 1906, uh, which, which uses a similar wording to the York Wanderer rules and it, it emphasizes on the common adventure. The second importance of common adventure is that if the GA does exist, the common adventure is a decisive factor on where and when the contributed values are calculated. In Rule G of the York Control Rules, it says general average shall be adjusted as regards both loss and contribution upon the basis of values at the time and place when and where the adventure ends. Rule, uh, rule 17 also says that the contribution to the general average shall be made upon the actual net values of property at the termination of the adventure. And finally, the length of the venture would affect the allowance to be made in GA, particularly the detention cost allowable under Rule 11B. Under this rule, the detention costs are allowable only if the vessel was detained for the common safety or to enable damage repairs that are necessary for the safe prosecution of the voyage. This means that there has to be a voyage to prosecute following the detention. If the vessel was attained after the common adventure is complete, completed, there is no voyage to go back to and therefore no allowance for the detention cost. Now we look into what a, a common adventure when the vessel is in ballast. From now on, we will assume that all other criteria for GA under Rule A is satisfied. And under English law, we have to break the situation down into three different categories. Namely, first, under the voyage charter entered by the ship owners. Uh, this is effectively, there's no time charter involved. The second category is that under a time charter loan or time charter and a voyage charter entered by the time charter, time charters. And thirdly, when the vessel does not have any charter. So these are the three categories that we look into one by one. The first situation where the vessel is under voyage charter alone is relatively simple under English law, thanks to the law case that dealt with pretty much exact the same situation. In SS Carisbrook Company and London Provincial Marine Insurance Company, uh, the vessel was chartered for the round trip from England to uh, USA and then load the cargo there and then go back to the either England or European port. Uh, on the way to the loading port, the vessel went aground and made a sacrifice. <coughs> uh, in this case, the judge held that the freight at risk should contribute to GA regardless of whether the cargo is already on board, as the vessel was discharging her obligation and the charter as much before the goods are put on board as afterwards. This ruling is summarized in Rules of Practice B26 of the Association of Average Adjusters. 
it starts when the vessel is proceeding in ballast to load and the voyage charter entered into by the ship owner before the general result. So that's just clarify we are dealing with one situation only. Uh, subsection A is regarding what to contribute to GA. It includes the vessel and any other property on board belonging to parties other than the owners. And most importantly, the freight and under the voyage charter. The next subsection clarifies what the command venture is when the vessel is under voyage charter. Effectively, under English law, the whole of the chartered carriage, including both ballast and laden leg, is considered to be a common venture between the ship owner and voyage charterers. So the first, first category was fairly simple. Now the second category, uh, when the vessel is under time charter. The first question to ask is what interest is involved? So this is also a fairly simple question uh, as the time charter as banker has been long accepted to form a separate interest in a general average case. So the interest involved in this case will be vessel and time charter as banker. Now the next question is where things become slightly more complicated. As a banker go wherever the vessel goes and the boss party needs a vessel to be in operation, it is clear that there's a common interest in keeping the vessel safe and uh, getting it back to operation following a casualty. And so there must be a common adventure between the ship owners and charterers. However, defining exactly when the adventure ends for the purpose of GA has been difficult, as the time charter is generally not tied to a particular voyage. Also, due to the nature of time charter, where the charterers have general freedom to decide where they want the vessel to go, load and deliver the cargo, the vessel's loading port may be changed due to a, due to a casualty or due to delay. In this case, should the voyage that the vessel ends up doing be considered the same voyage? Or there may be a subcharter involved, which the owners are not party to, and it may be cancelled due to the casualty while the main time charter is still in place. Should this lead to adventure terminating? Unfortunately, unlike ballast voyage and the, the voyage charter alone, there is no legal precedent to assist in this uh, points. Uh, for this reason, we need to look into the rules of practice of association of village adjusters, rule B26, on this point. Uh, before looking into the specific rules dealing with the ballast boys under the time charter, it is worth noting that rule B26 is meant to be for the purpose of insurance claim and the policy subject to English law and practice. So strictly speaking, it is not to assist interpretation on the actual GA claims under the charter party between the owners and time charters. The actual relation between owners and time charter may perhaps be governed by the local law where the adventure ends, but such law is also disregarded for the purpose of insurance per the second paragraph shown in the presentation. Uh, now the main part of the rule B26, relating to the voyage and the time charter. Uh, in the subsection A, uh, the, the general average shall attach to the vessel and such items of bankers, stores, equipment as belong to parties other than the owners of the vessel. So that clarifies who to uh, contribute in the GA. And failing a prior termination of the time charter, values for the purpose of contribution shall be those pertaining at the time that the ship is or should have been made ready to depart from the port of refuge. And subsection B says, failing a prior termination of the time charter, the voyage shall be deemed to end at the first port of discharge of cargo at which the vessel arrives after the General Average Act. So in a nutshell, this uh, section says, contributed value is taken when the ship is or should have been made ready to depart from the port of refuge. And the voyage ends 
and the first port of discharge of cargo after GA. So some of you may be wondering why there are two different timing involved here. Uh, usually, with a cargo on board, the value of the property is taken when the cargo discharge is completed, which is when the common adventure is terminated. The wording is a result of a pragmatic approach. Uh, when the rules were updated in 2022, the association tried to, uh, tried to keep the uniformity of claims across different other positions and different casualty situations. So the subsection A was drafted to disregard any change in the Lord Port, as change of Lord Port tended to raise a question when the adventure ends. So it was considered practical to take earlier point of the GA situation, which was decided a port of refuge, to reduce anomalies as much as possible and keep uniformity of treatment. And subsection B was drafted effectively to clarify what the voyage to prosecute is in relation to Rule 11 allowances. Under English practice, it's been considered that the purpose of GA during ballast voyage is to complete not only the ballast leg to the loading port, but also to complete the following laden leg to the destination. So subsection B just clarifies the existing practice in English uh, English law that makes the <clears throat> allowance as close up as possible regardless of the charter position. Uh, the la lastly, there's a one section that I just quickly touched on. The rules of practice pr provides a time charter hire at risk and time charter as voyage freight at risk, if any, will not contribute to GA within the scope of rules of practice, which is to ascertain the policy claim. Um, I couldn't find the rationale why such treatment originally started, but uh, yeah, this certainly makes the adjustment of ballast chain and average simple. And uh, I've been told that this has been, this clause has been around for nearly 75 years. So I don't think there's much to discuss for today. The, finally, uh, we get into the third situation of ballast GA. Uh, it, this is when there's no charter involved. This, it, this means that there's no interest other than the vessel, and therefore there's no common adventure. So it is simple, and the English law, there's no general average. Um, this means that the ship owners won't be able to claim the proper general average under the insurance policy. Well, some costs such as salvage or towage to the port of refuge may be recoverable as part of sewer and labor expenses or perhaps part of a reasonable cost of repairs, the owners wouldn't be able to recover uh, some of the detention costs, such as crew wages and maintenance, unless they can claim as a general average. So someone might think this is unfair because the the situation is different purely because of the charter, charter position and the action that owners take is exactly the same. So to cover this situation and in order to put the owner's recovery position as close to the other ballast GA situation as possible, a special clause is included in a standard how policy. The institute time clauses how in 83 has this ballast GA clause. Uh, this stipulates that when the vessel stays in ballast, not under charter, the provision of your quant rule 74 applies and the voyage for this purpose shall be deemed to continue from the port or place of department, uh, departure until the arrival of the vessel at the first port or place thereafter other than port of refuge. Uh, uh, the stipulation of the voyage and uh, voyage is uh, slightly different from the rules of practice, but I think in practice, uh, this stipulation covers pretty much all the situation that may arise. Uh, the Institute Time Clause 95 has uh, exactly the same wording, except that it refers to 94 rules. So, so far, we look at the old situation on Ballast GA under the English law. So 
Now I'll briefly look into how the owner can recover their disbursement. And as we look into detail, when the balance GA happens under either a Boyer's charter or time charter, there is a proper general average under the English law. Therefore, the owner can claim the disbursement under the Hull policy in the same manner as any other GA with a cargo on board. So the first <coughs> clause to look at is probably GA absorption clause because most of the time the, it, it, uh, the claim under the absorption clause doesn't attract policy deductible. So as long as the amount is below the limit, um, it may be beneficial for the owners. Uh, otherwise, the GA is adjusted in accordance with the charter party and the ship's proportion will be uh, recoverable under the usual GA clause, uh, such as clause 11, of the ITC 83 subject to under insurance. Uh, as is the case in is a usual GA with cargo, sacrifice is fully recoverable under the Hull policy and GA claim is usually subject to policy deductible unless otherwise provided. Since the owners may be recovering the ship's proportion of GA only under the Hull policy, I wonder if there's any way to recover other interested proportion when the GA has to be apportioned. If the vessel was under Boyer's charter, the freight proportion of GA is also due from the ship owners, also as a separate interest. If they have a freight policy, freight's proportion of GA can be claimed under the policy. However, I understand not many owners nowadays take out the freight policy. So effectively it falls on the ship owners. If the vessel was under time charter, the banker's proportion of GA is recoverable from the charters in principle. Uh, while the rules of practice P626 may give a good guidance on what to look at and how to consider, as mentioned earlier, the rule is for the purpose of policy claim only. So technically not a guidance to in interpret the actual GA claim on the charter party. So I think uh, applying B26 for this situation to claim from the charter uh, needs a caution and treatment probably needs to be looked at on case by case basis. Well, luckily either way, freight proportion or banker proportion, they tend to be relatively moderate amount. So it may not come up as a big issue frequently. As we already mentioned, ballast GA without charter is not a proper general average under the English law. Therefore, the claim where the vessel was no, under no charter has to be made either under sue and labor clause or ballast GA clause. Uh, if it is claimed under sue and labor clause, the claim is subject to under insurance and policy deductible. And if it's under ballast general average clause and the ITC, the under insurance doesn't apply to the claim, uh, but the policy deductible still applies. So I explained all about the ballast GA so far in detail, but what's the benefit of ballast GA if this is, uh, yeah, if this is uh, something to consider? For the full cover how policy, which means uh, usual uh, clause six perils, covering that particular average under the policy. The main benefit in making a claim under ballast GA is allowances to crew wages and maintenance and bankers during the permanent repairs. Even without the ballast GA, the other costs such as towage or port charges may fall in a category as salvage or reasonable cost of repairs, but crew wages and maintenance is something that you can only claim as a part of a GA claim. However, if the policy is on limited cover, such as free from particular average or total loss and GA collision liability cover, the benefit is much bigger. While the actual shipyard cost or actual repair cost st is still not recoverable because that falls on the particular average, the claim may now include some of the costs that would have been otherwise considered part of damage repair costs, such as port charges, temporary repairs, removal to the repair port. Also, the GA sacrifice can be claimable as part of GA. 
Um, as an average adjuster, it doesn't often happen that I can tell the ship owners that they can claim more than they originally claimed. So this is usually a good point to look at and in order to assist the ship owners recovery. So that's all for the English law and pr uh, practice. And I'll be look at the different policy, uh, uh, namely the American clause and Nordic plan. The first is American Institute How clause. This clause doesn't have a balanced GA clause. The reason is that under the American law, the insurers are considered to be a separate interest in the general average. So as long as the vessel is insured, there are multiple interests involved, even during the ballast voyage. So effectively, there's no need for ballast GA concept. Also, interestingly, according to the leading textbook of Bugulus, there is no legal basis for the freight at risk to contribute to GA during the ballast voyage under the American law. Uh, he also says that this effectively means that the voyage is considered separate for the ballast leg up to the loading port and the following laden leg. So on this basis, if a casualty happens during the ballast leg, the voyage is considered to end upon arrival at the loading port and therefore no allowance for detention afterwards. It also appears to me that on this basis that, that GA, during, uh, GA during ballast voyage and the time charter would have the same result, where the ballast voyage up to the loading port and laden voyage is considered separate. While higher at risk during ballast voyage will not contribute to GA, it is an established practice that the charterer's bunker would contribute to the general average separately. Uh, Bugler also discussed the difficulty on determining when the voyage in ballast terminates for general average purpose. The, he said that voyage may continue for GA purpose even if the charter is cancelled which is a different treatment compared to our rules of practice in England. And as long as the vessel has proceeded to the same geographical area, uh, the adventure carries on. Uh, on this point, I think we do have the same issues under English law uh, in determining when the voyage ends in a legal sense, but at least the rules of practice has clarification for the insurance claim purpose. The rules of practice of the association averages are in the USA and Canada does have rule for ballast GA. But it seems silent on the point uh, when the voyage ends. So some detailed analysis will be necessary when considering general, a ballast general average under American practice. Under this American clause, once the claim for the general average during ballast voyage is established, the application to the policy is very simple. As all ballast GA is considered a proper general average under the American law, ship's proportion of GA is all claimable under the policy in the usual manner under the standard GA clause. Uh, one thing to note is that unlike under English law, the full amount of GA is recoverable when the vessel was in ballast under voyage charter, as freight do not contribute to GA. Um, this analysis here is all based on uh, American clause under the American law. Uh, policy incorporating American clause are usually subject to American law, and I think it's important it is that way as far as the ballast GA is concerned, considering the different legal interpretation on this topic between American and English law. The next policy I look at is a Nordic plan. That plan has a clause called assumed general average, which deal with the ballast GA situation. The first thing I would note is that there's no distinction depending on the charter position, which makes it uh, much simpler. But another point I would note is that the clause referred to the loss incurred for the purpose of saving a vessel in ballast or completing a voyage in ballast and nothing about the onward voyage with cargo. The commentary of the plan uses the same phrasing. So based on that wording, 
it looks to me that the cover under this clause is more restrictive than the, our English practice. And once it reaches, a, once the vessel reaches a loading port, no more GL once it it's made. Um, another restriction placed under this clause is for crew wages and maintenance during permanent repairs. Uh, but this restriction only applies to the wages and maintenance incurred during permanent repairs and not during removal to and from the port of refuge. Also, the commentary says that the limitation doesn't apply to any waiting time before the permanent repair starts, but does apply to the waiting time during the repairs due to, uh, lead, lead, for example, lead time of the parts. And another point is that this clause doesn't require any apportionments of GA, so the owners would be able to recover the allowable expenses in full. Uh, another restriction placed on in this clause is the uh, GA commission and interest. However, the, under the plan, uh, the usual plan interest is claimable for the assumed general average. And I notice that the current rate under the 2023 version of the plan is 8.5%. So it is actually not too far off from what you will recover from a GA commission and interest. Here's a summary of the difference between the English and Nordic uh, English policy and Nordic plan. Uh, the, the couple more things to note is that under plan, uh, there's no under insurance and no deductible applicable for the GA claim, uh, but that is common to a proper general average or assumed general average. So that is all from my presentation. And I think as a conclusion, I think ballast GA is a helpful concept for the hull machinery cover to put the owners in as similar position as possible, regardless of the, whether the cargo is on board or not. But under English law, the charter position has to be looked into to make sure that accurate adjustment and claim payment is made under the English policy. Uh, rules of practice uh, of Association B26 gives a uh, very good clear guidance in this respect, I think. And uh, ballast GA is usually covered under the main standard policies in the London market, but the treatment is slightly different and uh, uh, depending on the policy and applicable law. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadami. I'm sure there are questions. Actually, uh, I, I don't have a question. I have an addition because you said uh, when uh, marine insurance policy uh, is subject to the American Institute Hull clauses, it usually is under American law. I don't think that's correct. Mm. Uh, and, and I have seen many policies that are actually subject to, to English law. Mm. And it's very important that these policies include uh, the so-called New York Sewable Clause, which is a clause that ensures that the, the intentions of American law are still kept. So uh, just remember to tell your clients that have American uh, uh, high conditions and, and English law. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the addition. Who has a question? Mavis. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Could you give an example of the detention situation you referred to where there could be crew wages and maintenance and bunkers covered? Does it specifically require repairs to the vessel or could it be a detainment by a port authority, let's say, given the accident? Um, the usual GA criteria applies. So, the first, firstly, the, the the vessel has to be detained uh, because of the casualty, as a result of casualty, or common safety, or repairs for the repairs necessary for the safe prosecution of voyage. So, the simple detention by the authority 
doesn't necessarily put the vessel in the situation. So the, the criteria has to be followed uh, according to the rule 11 of the Yokuanto rules. Richard. <laughs> Um, thank you so much uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. It's a difficult subject, and yeah. uh, let me see if I can ask a, a meaningful question. I was interested to see that, uh, according to Bugliss, uh, under uh, American law, there's no allowance for uh, detention expenses, and it got me wondering uh, whether that uh, might actually also be true under English law. Now, I understand that you've got uh, rule of practice B26, yeah. Uh, under um, the uh, English uh, rules of practice. But that, as you mentioned, only applies as regards claims against insurers. Mm. So let's put that to one side yeah. and concentrate on uh, claims uh, against uh, bunkers yeah. uh, for contributions in general average. Uh, and um, of course, you've got rule A, uh, which mentions uh, the common maritime adventure. Mm. And I could well see that uh, bunkers and ship might be exposed to a common uh, peril, uh, and rule A might get off the ground. But that, of course, isn't concerned with detention expenses, mm. for which we need to look at rules 10 and 11. Yeah. Uh, and rules 10 and 11 instead use uh, the expression voyage. It, it doesn't use the expression adventure. Mm. Uh, and one goes then to the trade green, uh, which was a decision on what the voyage means. Uh, and a voyage begins when a ship either enters upon a chartered voyage or when she takes on board any carriage, uh, any cargo for carriage and terminates when delivery of the whole cargo is completed or abandoned or partly completed and for the rest abandoned. So it's all there to do with carriage of cargo. Mm. So we're not in that situation. So is it therefore the case that if you're claiming a contribution against bunkers, you simply can't get a, a claim for detention expenses off the ground because there isn't any voyage. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And the difference between adventure and voyage is actually I intentionally avoided getting in too much in my presentation. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. And uh, as I said, the rules of practice especially the, the one applied to the voyage and the charter, doesn't really have a legal precedent. So when you look at it in terms of recovery from the bankers, there, there, there may be a difficulty applying the same rule. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, in that sense that, uh, as I said, that it needs to be looked into the case by case basis and there may be the case, as you mentioned, that there's no ground that the voyage carries on after the arrival at the, at the loading port. But uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's an interesting and difficult point, and I I probably need a little bit more research to answer. It well, I could say it wasn't my point. Yeah. Um, I didn't dream this one up. It's um it's referred to in a paper by uh, Ian Bramwell who um, submitted to the Association of Average Justice on the 23rd of May 2016, when a committee was looking at um, mm. time charters, uh, vessels under ballast, uh, and where orders from the time charter are changes. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's one out there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the good question. There, there was a lot of discussion at the time and the result was the uh, redrafting of uh, Rule B26. And uh, we thought that uh, we had resolved it all <laughs> with that new wording, but uh, apparently not. Uh, it's a fact that the York Antwerp rules uh, did not have a ballast GA in mind. So they, they were not considering a ballast GA. It's an assumed general average or as the uh, the German commentary said uh, it's it's a non-genuine general average, and and we are borrowing uh, basically the the principles of the York Antwerp rules to uh, adjust uh, a claim under the Hull policy under the York Antwerp rules, uh, which actually is a bit artificial. 
and uh, since Nanami mentioned uh, English conditions, Nordic plan and American conditions, uh, let me just add the situation under German conditions, because uh, both clause 35.3 uh, of the DTV high clauses uh, 78 92 and also the new DTV ADS 2009 clauses and that's clause uh, 28.5 have the same wording and surprisingly because I know the German law and regulations is, is not always uh, straightforward and, and likes to complicate things that could be uh, a bit uh, done a bit easier uh, both clauses start with the words, if the vessel sails without cargo or with owner's cargo only. So they're omitting the words uh, and not under charter. So actually, if you have German conditions and the ship doesn't have cargo, it doesn't really matter whether the ship is under time charter, whether she has time charter as bunkers. Uh, you can adjust the GA just under the principles of the York Uncle rules. Any questions? Just a quick question. Thank you for your presentation. That's great. Um, you mentioned under the American section about the insurer being a party or an entity. I didn't quite follow that. What did that mean? Uh, so, under American law, the insurers are considered a party to general average so whether the vessel can complete the uh, voyage or not is the interest of the insurers uh, to avoid say loss of the vessel so in that sense the insurers is considered uh, another interest to the general average so as long as the, insu uh, the vessel is insured without the cargo there's two separate interests that benefits from the ga act so that's that's the that's the American law, uh, uh, yeah, state uh, position. Does it does it answer your question? It yeah. And it it doesn't specifically say that uh, the insurer is a party to the general average. It only says that uh, the insurer has an interest of the ship completing the voyage, and uh, that's that's of course correct because uh, if no measures are taken, no sacrifices made or expenditure incurred, then the insurer will have to pay. Would there be any questions from uh, uh, the online listeners? We, we don't have any questions online at the moment, but if anybody would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat box so our speaker can answer. Very quick question. In these ballast GAs, I mean, in your experience, it's a bit of an open question. The percentage between the H&M values and bunkers and freight at risk, etc., tiny, isn't it? Uh, yeah, from my experience uh, in in ballast GA case, <clears throat> well, it it was often within the absorption clause to begin with, and if not, the <clears throat> bunker contribution. Uh, tends to be quite small and I actually I don't think I had a uh, I had to apportion over freight in the previous cases but I would imagine that freight wouldn't be contributing the full value of the freight we have to deduct the contingency cost from it which may well be a quite big portion of the freight in any case so the end result would be that uh, I would say it's it might not be the smallest but it's small yeah thanks any more questions no very good then i would like to thank uh, nanami for presenting today i would also like to thank uh, deborah finch and the iua for the perfect organization and it's my pleasure to invite you for a sandwich lunch, as usual, which is next door. Thank you.